This morning I'm in Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, visiting with Bridget Reicher, who is Collection Development Librarian for Foreign and International Law here at the Harvard Law Library. Bridget, I appreciate your time this morning and also inviting me to uh, be here at the library, you and Kim, and use this marvelous conference room where we're sitting. Uh, oh, it's a pleasure. Okay. Well, it's sort of our custom to start out these uh, conversations, as I like to call them, uh, by finding out a little bit about you as a regular person, not just a colleague. Uh, not that there's necessarily any difference, but still. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about your life, uh, not only perhaps today, but when you were younger? Um, I don't know. I'm a, an international child. My father worked for the United Nations, and mm -hmm. I spent a piece of my childhood living in places like Jordan and Pakistan and going to school in England. Mm -hmm. um, You've been around. I've otherwise. been around, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and I come, I would say, from Washington, D.C. That's my home, but I've been here in Cambridge for 25 years. Mm -hmm. I would think Cambridge, Boston area would be sort of a home, too, then. By the day. It so is, I'm but you know, when here, when somebody asks you if you come from here, you don't unless you were born here. Mm -hmm. So. I come from Washington, the Washington, D.C. suburbs. Well, you know, actually, you're sort of the exception there. Uh, I lived there for a while when I was working at, in, in Washington, and so many of the people are from other places. So you're a, is, a native of that Washington area. I'm a native of the Washington area. I, and interestingly, we, um, we used to joke that you'd start elementary school with one group of people, and then everybody would travel, and then you'd end up in high school, as I did the last couple of years of high school, with the same people that so I'd gone to first goes grade. So full with. circle, huh? Yeah, They're everybody back. comes back. Okay, right. well, that's interesting. I hadn't realized that. I knew that the houses in our neighborhood tended to turn over quite frequently, a lot of them, but. Uh, which you don't see in many other cities. No, you know, you change administrations and people are in the foreign service or they're in the military and they come and they go. Yeah, well, but we had a home there and that's where we came back. Uh -huh. Well, that's so. nice, uh, nice to know. Um, now, sort of to, in order to complete a picture of you, could I ask if you have any particular hobbies or other special interests or passions that um, outside of work? Um, I read, mm -hmm. I cook, and I work with um, textiles. I, textiles. I knit and I felt, both well, mostly well, wet felting, basically. Uh -huh. And I have a 16-year-old daughter, so that's a... She keeps you busy, That's too. not a hobby, but that keeps yeah. us busy, yeah. Well, uh, those are the years when she's doing so much, too. You must be busy just watching, <laughs> tired just yeah. watching her activities. She's a gymnast, and I've learned a oh, lot about she? gymnastics just oh, going man. to the gym. Mm -hmm. So well, That must be very uh, enjoyable to, to be it's able fun. to do that. It's really fun. Yeah. Well, sort of changing the focus now, Bridget, to you uh, as a professional. I know you have two degrees. Could you tell us about what they are and where you earned each? I... Um, started out in college at, at the University of Kansas for two years mm -hmm. and then transferred back east where I finished my degree, which was basically Latin American history at George Mason University in mm -hmm. Fairfax, Virginia. Mm -hmm. And um, I then went abroad for a year as an au pair in France. Mm -hmm. And when I came back, I needed a job and I ended up in a law firm, which led me to going to Catholic University um, to do my MLS and I worked while I was going to library school. Mm -hmm. So you were back in Washington, you got a job with the firm, Howard and Simon, as right. I recall, and uh, then you went to library school at Catholic U. What was it like to, I mean, we hear that working in the private law sector is always very demanding. Uh, it must have been a challenge to do both, or was it? Not really. Um, in the era when I was in Washington, most young people working in the libraries were going to library school at night. It, okay. it was basically, many of us went to Catholic University because they had a very good law program that was run by um, the uh, law librarian, the Anglo-American law librarian of Congress at the time was actually Mar teaching. Marlene McGurl. Marlene McGurl. Oh yeah, she yeah. was a legend. She uh, was a legend. She did that she, a long time. People said, 
very positive things about that. She program. was actually a really good teacher, and it was fun because we actually were doing it in parallel with people at the Law Library of Congress. Mm -hmm. And so we did our homework actually in the Law Library, which was nice because usually they'd pull the books off the shelf so you knew where to go mm -hmm. when you're doing legal bib. Um, but yeah, that's where, that's how I sort of fed into law librarianship. Uh -huh. Because I'd actually worked both in high school and in college, both in public libraries and a university library. But um, in those days, uh, working for a private law firm paid better. So yeah. that's where we ended up. Well, we figured it paid well, but it were, the work was uh, challenging too. Cause it, was, it was fun. Yeah. Well, you uh, got the library degree, and mm -hmm. then you changed uh, to another firm. Uh, how long were you at Howard? Howard? I was at Howard for about two and a half years, uh -huh. from early 77 until I graduated from library school and got a job in later in 79. Okay. Well, then you moved uh, to the other firm, uh, LeBoeuf? Le it was LeBoeuf, Lamb, Libby, and McRae. Yeah. Thank you. I have, <laughs> I'm challenged right. when it, it comes it, to some of these names. Well, Howie and Simon and LeBuff Lamb no longer exist. Uh -huh. So it's sort of an interesting life experience. Well, that happens too, or they merge or whatever. They comes were out. Um, big firms that ex imploded, basically, yeah. and are gone. So yeah. That happens too, I'm yep. afraid. Yes, and certainly more so in more recent times than perhaps older times. Yeah. As the whole practice, uh, the economics of it has changed, changed. a lot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, can I ask you sort of, uh, you start off with a law firm uh, library, you're not yet a credentialed librarian in terms of, uh, you know, having the degree, but can I ask you how you happened to decide uh, after all this activities in your youth and early years uh, to become a law librarian? It just happened. I mean, I found a job and went to work for a law firm as a library clerk because I'd had experience and I was interested in the law. And when you grow up in Washington, D.C., the Washington Post is your morning piece and it's full of the law. So it went from being a historian into being a law librarian. And at the time, I decided that since I don't actually like to write, mm -hmm. I would prefer to be a librarian than to go to law school. And so mm -hmm. I didn't do the dual degree route. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. You mentioned the Washington Post as part of your growing up years. Um, I, I like that paper very much. And today I can get it where I live, out on the West Coast, on my Kindle every right. morning. Yeah. And I thoroughly enjoy reading it there. Although of late, all the stories seem to be political. <laughs> well, that was the thing. The political news was always the hometown news. Well, that's Everybody right. we knew worked yeah. in some area of the government, so it was... Yeah, and we're in the midst of a uh, presidential um, yes, election process absolutely. right now. This is uh, September of uh, 2012, uh, 2016. 47 rather. days until the election. Is that... Uh, that's what it was. This, no, who's counting? <laughs> Can't come soon enough, really. Well, I, have in the car as I travel around, among other things, CNN and some of the other news channels, and I have been able to tolerate listening for about 20 minutes at most, most days, because it's just basically the, all the same sort of campaign stuff. Yeah, I'm after a news summary and then I turn it off. Yeah, so. that's about right for me too. <laughs> yeah. Well, you're working in Washington, D.C. at that time, um, and of course you've worked since. Is there anybody that you consider to have been a mentor in, in your uh, library career? I've had a couple. Um, when I, I went from the law firm where I was working to work for the, in, the Internal Revenue Service as their reference librarian in, in the chief counsel's office, mm -hmm. and I after 18 months was plucked out of there by um, Carolyn Brown, who was at the time the librarian at the um, executive office of the president, which is basically the White House library. Mm -hmm. And um, I went to work for her as the collection development librarian for the White House library complex. Mm -hmm. um, so I would count her as a mentor. And then later, um, when I was working in Austria for the UN, I worked for a woman named Margaret Cunningham, who had come from the um, 
Nuclear Regulatory Commission in Washington, and I learned a lot from her. And when I left there and came here, I worked for 15 years with Bob Buckwalter, who, from whom I learned an enormous amount. Well, I'm going to have the pleasure of uh, having one of these conversations with Bob this afternoon back here at the library after I pop downtown, downtown to uh, do one with a colleague down there. Well, it'll be interesting to hear what Bob has to say. So. Oh. Yeah, he's somebody I've known a long time. Yeah. Highly, uh, highly regarded, too. Well, as a collection development librarian, I learned immense amounts of things from him. Mm -hmm. Well, you actually also, uh, so you were with the executive office of the president right. at a point, but somewhere in between the firm and there, you were with the IRS library for a short Right, while. I went from about Luff, a year. Yeah, 18 months. I went, yeah. I sort of, a, at that point, it was easy to change jobs. There were interesting jobs. So I had a year and a bit at uh, the firm, and then I went to the IRS where I was a uh, librarian in the chief counsel's office. Um, and there were four of us on team at that point, and um, I was basically the reference librarian, manned the reference, and taught the early versions of, of Lexis, which was tax research. Oh, it sounds like uh, you had an interesting time, because uh, that was early on. That was very Lexus early on. Lexis was just coming in. Really. We had three Lexis terminals, yeah. which were the size yeah. of Great a big, desk. huge desks. Right. Did you have one with the phone where you had to actually dial Absolutely. in? Absolutely. We dialed and in, then dial, it in. And then hang up the old acoustical coupler, right. I think And 300 that. baud printing on oh, Telefax yeah. paper. And yeah. you'd sit there and wait for it to to do it, or even on the screen, it would start at the top loading the page exactly. and then eventually fill the whole screen in. Well, we yeah. were very patient in those days. Weren't and, we? and tax was where Lexus began because that was mm -hmm. the easiest thing to put into digital form. Yeah. So we were working with the attorneys and teaching them how to do research on Lexus. Ah. Well, you were in Washington working up for a few years, but in 1984 you uh, got back into the international uh, circuit of some yeah. sort, and you were back in Vienna, or moved to Vienna at least, and uh, took a position with the International Center Library there. Could yeah, you tell us a little bit about that, and, and maybe a little bit about the library? The Vienna International Center is the third largest UN um, center in the in the world, basically. You've got New York, then Geneva, and then Vienna. Vienna at that time housed, I suppose you could say, five international governmental agencies that were um, UNIDO, which was the Industrial Development Group, mm -hmm. the International Atomic Energy Agency, UNCITRAL, which is for trade law, and um, there were a couple of other smaller groups that were there. And at the time, it is no longer that way, but at the time, the library was run by the International Atomic Energy Agency, but for the entire complex. Mm -hmm. And so I was hired from the executive office of the president at that time to go work as what they called the circulation librarian at um, the VIC, which was basically I worked for the IAEA. Mm -hmm. And um, I had a team of people. I did some reference. I did collection development, um, mostly for nuclear energy, which was an interesting shift from being a law librarian. <laughs> I imagine so. And, uh, yeah, I had a group of um, on my team who managed the serials collections. The, we did interlibrary loan. We did technical reports. And I backstopped the librarian at Uncentral for law because mm -hmm. I had that background. And I was there for seven and a half years. Yes, I it know. It was great fun. There quite a while. Living in Vienna must have been very pleasurable in its own right. I mean, there's so much there. Uh, well, it was in the 80s, yeah. and we were um, still up against the Iron Curtain, so we should say. We, 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 we called it far the law. From right. Physically from it. And um, I had a a dentist in Budapest and a hairdresser in Budapest and you were more than up against the right Iron I mean curtain. and for an American at that point you had to um, get a visa every time you went to Budapest and we went through the Iron Curtain basically you would go through those things it was not as bad as Berlin but it was still touchy and I think in that time I only went to Prague two or three times because Prague was even more complicated getting into Czechoslovakia was tough yeah 
But, How uh, very different it is today. Very Just different. Last year, I was actually with a group of friends from where I live. We were over there traveling, and we were in Vienna, and then we drove over to Zakopane in Poland. And, mm -hmm. you, and know, you drove right across. And, and there, no passports, nothing it was needed. And we saw one of the borders where the um, facility had been. It was still there, but the road bypassed it now. Uh, so you could just drive by, but uh, I mean, to, from Vienna to Budapest is probably an hour and a half to two hour drive. Yeah, it's not very far. But it always took three and a half, sometimes four hours, because you had to get through the border. Yeah. And you had to go through from the Austrian side, and then you had to go through no man's land, and then you had to go in through Hungary, and you never knew whether they were going to hold you or not. Yeah. It was interesting. I suppose it was a little. You were always a little apprehensive when you would travel. I would say so because often we were carrying black market currency. Oh, because wow. <laughs> may have had reason. <laughs> Nobody today. in their right mind was going to go into Hungary and actually pay for everything at the official exchange rate. So uh, there was you could buy Hungarian or Czech currency in Austria at the time, and you just stick it in the bottom of your suitcase and go right through the border and pay for things at the price that the Hungarians or the, the Czechs would pay. The local price, mm -hmm. uh, well that would probably save you some money, I it would It would, guess. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it was, it was interesting. It was really a different way of living. Yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting to travel over the, and through those area now. It's, what, about 25 years since the Soviet uh, system broke down. And they're very Western. Uh, oh, yeah. I, I was struck with the, the, the way the people live, the, you know, their interests. Uh, it was sort of like being running around almost part of it with this country uh, in some ways. Um, and we used to take bananas because bananas. bananas were really hard for people to get. Oh. It was one of those things that the only place they could actually import them from, I think, was mostly Cuba. Uh -huh. And they were very expensive because they had to come in by air. Oh. So we would take a bunch of bananas because they cost us very little and mm. give them to people that we knew in Prague or in Budapest. An interesting you know, little offering for their yeah. hospitality. Yeah, I mean, well, really. Why not? Well, you were over there for almost eight years, uh, or thereabouts. Uh, and then in 1991, you returned to the United States, uh, not to Washington, D.C., but to here in the Boston, Cambridge area. Yes. And became a um, bibliographer for Western European and international law here at Harvard. Um, you filled that role for roughly 18 years, according to my notes, yep, uh, before becoming the collection development librarian in, in July of 2009. Um, and you assumed your present position and role of collection development librarian for foreign and international law here at Harvard in December of 2012, yep. if my notes are correct. Yeah, you're right. Good. Can I ask you to talk about uh, a bit about your work here at Harvard and, and, and all of these roles, these three roles you've had? Um, a big piece of my job has remained always the same, which is that I do collection development. I have, um, in the early years, we had only two bibliographers. We had someone, when I, my first years here, uh, we reported to Bob Buckwalter and there were two of us. One was Anglo-American law mm -hmm. and I was European and international law. Mm -hmm. um, Basically, we shopped. I mean, that's the best way to describe it. We no. basically um, have a budget that's really quite large compared to many universities, and we spend it, and we buy the law from the whole world. Mm -hmm. And it's been an enormous amount of fun. Harvard has a tradition here at the law school, and I imagine at the university in general, to, to be quite comprehensive in, in collection yeah. uh, building. We try. Um, I would say I've been here actually on the 1st of October, it'll be 25 years. Mm -hmm. In the beginning we actually bought more than, is, was, than we do now in terms of percentage of what's being published in the world. I mean the budget has grown probably three to four percent a year but it's not enough to keep up with what's being published. Mm -hmm. So over the years things have shifted and we still collect the law of the world. Um, 
and we try to collect the basic primary law wherever we can in the form of official gazettes. And a piece of our budget goes into doing that because they're very expensive. We have, over the years, gone from collecting everything in print to collecting things in microform to now deciding that we wouldn't put energy into places like Western Europe because they make their law available for free online. So okay. the energy now goes into the parts of the world that we would consider to be unstable or risky. So Africa, Latin America, where we can get the stuff in print. Um, we recently spent a chunk of money um, buying the official gazettes of Crimea because we found them right after the Russians moved over the border into the Ukraine and took over Crimea and decided that somebody had to have it in print. And so we have 20 years of Crimean gazettes now that are in our storage and probably a little bit in our digital line of what we're going to digitize. Well, that sounds nice for all of us. I mean, anybody that wants access to that information won't even have to come here to get it. You that's just have it out that's for the, the hope. whole world. That's the hope. That yeah. goes with the big project that Kim's been working on of, of uh, digitizing U.S. law and making it freely available. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I'm allowed to ask this question, but with all the political turmoil in uh, the Ukraine and Crimea and so on, with so we say adventures by a uh, certain uh, Russian president, uh, <laughs> allegedly. Um, were you able to, did you have any trouble getting this material? Or was no, it, it was available. Getting, Somebody in the Ukraine had it, and we just bought it. So you were able to buy it from the side that right. we can still do. Well, from on. one of our normal vendors who oh. buy for us in, the, in Eastern Europe. Oh. So, yeah. No, it wasn't, it, you know, I, I expect now, because we're a couple of years on from that, it would be mm -hmm. much harder to find. So yeah, it would sound like it might be because uh, of all the turmoil in that whole country and region right now. Especially on the eastern side, yeah. yeah. I mean, one of the things about this job has been, and you know, most of my jobs has been that the morning news is really important to me, mm -hmm. and um, I read newspapers and I listen to the radio and NPR is a godsend, yeah. except during the election season. Um, and I listen to the BBC and I, I gather that kind of information and that informs what we buy. Yeah. And the change in the job here has been actually a piece of Bob retiring and then a reorganization a few years later and then yet another reorganization. So each time we reorganized, my job changed. And where we used to have only two people doing selection, we are now up to, I think there's a team of 10 of us. That's quite an increase. Yeah. Uh, and it's interesting, I was going to ask you a little more about, uh, you know, most of the law school libraries uh, are on, uh, should we say, trying times right now, but I think you've already pretty well described some of the changes you've made during the last seven or eight years when so many libraries were cutting back. Um, it sounds like you really didn't have too much, you just changed the focus, or is that we, correct? I mean, we cut back. Um, in the sense that we were in an LMA, which uh -huh. you may remember the LMAs. Yes. This was with um, West, and we were stuck at the time of the financial crash when Harvard lost a big piece of its endowment, and oh. they pulled a piece of our budget. Okay. Um, we were stuck. I mean, we had to pay West what we were having to pay West, but we had to cut back on buying things. And you can't, in the middle of a fiscal year, you can't cut your serial subscriptions, and so we ended up not buying monographs, which oh. is problematic because oh, yeah. for some parts of the world, forever. they're lost forever. Yeah. So a piece of this was that once we were out from underneath the LMA, we saved ourselves close to $500,000. Wow. And we made this decision that because we could do this without having to have the print, um, we reduced the amount of U.S. print that we were collecting. Mm -hmm. When I first came to Harvard, we had five copies of the reporter system mm -hmm. in the reading room or with the faculty library and, and a couple of other places. There were three on the shelves. And now we don't subscribe at all. Okay. I hear the same story from many places where they, uh, now that you have Westlaw, with exactly the same content, right. and users really inclined to want to use it just in digital, from what I'm told, I, too. The students don't, I mean, seriously, the yeah. students don't think that there's anything in print when they're doing research. Well, there's an old joke, I keep telling it on 
from time to time on some of these conversations of the student sitting in a chair just like you are with a screen in front of him or her and a whole wall of books right behind them. And if that student does not see what the student wants on that screen, it doesn't exist. That would be, yeah. I mean, certainly when they're doing case research or regulation research, that applies. Mm -hmm. um, we do find that um, they want their treatises in print. I've heard that. The, the e-book uh, push has just not been uh, particularly successful. Well, we're buying more and more e-books, uh -huh. but we're buying the print too. Okay. So, for instance, we'll subscribe to the complete um, opus of Oxford Scholarship Online, uh -huh. online, but we're buying every single one of the monographs that are legal treatises of value too, because yeah. we used to have to buy two, now we buy one and we buy them online. So the online becomes sort of the, the one that's always on the shelf, so to speak? It's always on the shelf and it's multiple user and they can yeah. do their research that way and then if they need to make a photocopy they can do it out of that. And the students like it, the faculty like it less. Well, you know, I used to joke that we as law librarians were really diabolical people and that we had introduced our students and faculty to photocopies back when the better quality Xerox and other machines came along probably about 50 years ago. And nobody really was using the books for the most part except to make photocopies so they could write on them and do whatever they wanted. And now with the digital, you can just hit print if you have the right equipment, and, the, and everyone does, and then basically you have a much easier to obtain photocopy of the original Absolutely. from that source. You press a button and you've got it. And it's there. Right. Yeah. Yes, very much. Well, so uh, um, the one big last project that mm -hmm. I'm working on here, and I say last project because I expect that I'll retire in the next two or three years. Well, I recommend it when it comes. Yes, yeah, so that's, my husband leads recommends to it a as nice well. <laughs> part of life uh, uh, where every morning you get up and it's Saturday morning for some well, reason. Yep, that's what I'm told by everybody who went before me. I have a, a whole group of people because over the years Harvard did a couple of big buyouts uh -huh. and um, a number of colleagues who were older than I was and therefore ready to go took it and I see them at the gym and I um, have lunch with them, I go to the theater with them and they don't have to get up in the morning and I still do. So it is it's nice. interesting. My poor son lives with me, in fact he and his wife and I have a house where it works well and I'm glad to have them actually uh, for a lot of variety of reasons including if I ever found on the floor someday, somebody, somebody, somebody will find you. me. Right. <laughs> Yeah, and he has to go. He's he's gone in the morning before I get up. Uh, he's off to work, so uh, I remember those days. Yeah, well, my husband's now down to half time, but he's a doctor yes. and he's a, a psychiatrist, so he has more flexibility. So than he I'm has most. some patients yeah. still, but yeah, not quite not as, as many. Not as many as he used to. Mm -hmm. But the big last project for me here is the emptying of our international legal studies building, which is called Lewis, and okay. we are. Um, going to lose the building by sometime in 2018 and so we have a team of people in the collection development group who are actually working on emptying the building. We have uh -huh. to move um, a quarter of a million books out of the building and we have to shoehorn into this building Langdell as much as we possibly can. So we're making really kind of draconian decisions about what stays and what goes and uh -huh. we fortunately have um, 80% of our collection is already off-site in remote storage, but when you're working with foreign and international law, it's really difficult for people to work with books where there are no indexes. So mm -hmm. if you're dealing with the Italian material and you're dealing, the Germans are better, but the Italians and the French and others simply don't have the digital access to all of their legal materials that we are used to in the U.S. So we're basically trying to decide what can stay here and what can go. And the English language materials are high on the list of things that are going to go into remote storage. Mm -hmm. And we're splitting what we doing what we call a date split, where we're going to keep on the shelf only the current five years of material. So you still use the uh, facility off campus for, uh, for storage of uh, paper? Uh, Absolutely. Books. 
Yeah, yeah absolutely. Because yeah, I wondered about that in today's world, if that it, was starting to change or not. For the law writ large, yes. For some publishers, we've begun to not buy their print. Uh -huh. But for most, we're still a little bit in that mindset of being a research library and we have things that were collected 150 years ago that are in print and that are still alive. Yeah. And the print is still a better archival source. CD-ROMs, forget it. They're plastic and they're metal and they're going to fall apart. And it's predicted they have a finite life, uh, even if they're very nice when they're new. But 30 or 40 years from now, who knows? If you even have equipment that can read them. No, that's the other problem. So we've got microfilm and microfiche, and we've got several hundred years of print, and we'll keep as much of that as we possibly can. Mm -hmm. And the university is going to, at some point, build another module to our remote storage. But the, the remote storage, if you should ever have a chance to see it, looks like the inside of a Costco warehouse. 30-foot yeah. stacks, and every we, book has a barcode. We had one in um, the Washington Research Library Consortium uh, put uh, such a facility right. together near D.C. for all of the local universities, yeah. and we were part of that. And I did tour it. Uh, it was also cold walking through there. They had all the temperatures yep. nice and low to preserve everything. Right. I mean, at this point, we keep our rare materials here on campus, but the bulk of the collection is out at what we call HD, the Harvard yeah. Depository. You've always been perceived by the rest of us as sort of the library of last resort uh, for obtaining very unusual sorts of uh, and information. And that's, in fact, where we put our focus. Yeah. That we're trying not to collect a vanilla collection. We're trying to make it spicier. Mm. Well, my usual next uh, approach or question is to ask if there's any uh, professional activities outside of the uh, library that you have engaged in over the years that you'd like to mention. Mm, not a lot. I was very involved um, in the 90s with the International uh, Association of Law Libraries, mm -hmm. and I still go to their meet meetings from time to time. Uh, at the point at which I uh, adopted a child, it became much more difficult to do a lot of outside Your meeting priorities things. Changed. My priorities and changed. Yes. So that was 16 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so they're it, still changing. And they're still changing. And um, I am involved within the university and I have worked very closely with IALL. Um, but these days, I think I sort of would say I'm on the downward slope. and. Uh, the pre my job is mentoring. Uh, cut back a little bit here and there as if you yeah. can. And yeah. you probably can't really, but it's still well, nice to think about it. I, I look at my next couple of years here as being, um, uh, we call it mind melding, sort of like in the Star Trek vote mode, that I'm trying to teach everybody everything that I've learned and what my predecessors before me knew. And that's where my focus is. Uh, so that I can leave and leave feeling that they have everything that I know. That's great. That's the way you want to do it if you can. Yeah. Go out the door and you're not so indispensable that the chaos sets in. Uh, then you've done it right. Well, nobody's indispensable. Well, but, um, some of them try and keep themselves as close to it as possible. That's true. And then that's they true. retire. I don't know what happens then. Probably the place survives just fine. I, that's been my Maybe experience. Maybe even a little better without yep. that person. <laughs> <laughs> that's been my experience. But yeah. basically, we're we've expanded the number of people working in collection development here, and mm -hmm. that means that there are more people to depend on, and everybody has a little piece of the pie, and we try to make sure that everybody knows as much as possible. Good. Well, we're so, sort of nearing uh, the end of today's conversation, Bridget, but before we do, it's customary to ask if there's anything we've not talked about that uh, you would like to mention. No, I think we've covered it all. Oh, that's and, usually um, the answer I get, right. too. Yeah. But, this, but not yeah, always. <laughs> no, this, this has been really great, all and right. I hope that um, my life experience has been useful to somebody. Very good. Well, it sounds like it has been, and uh, it's fascinating the things you described that you've been doing, and... You know, it's fun to come to a place like Harvard where you are able to do a lot of that and then yeah. hear about some of the things uh, that, you know, those of us beyond the institution sort of take for granted you're doing, but we don't really know for sure. <laughs> so that's yeah. good. It's been really um, an interesting 25 years working here because 
you're working with students who are really bright and mm -hmm. faculty who are complicated and staff who really enjoy what they do. Mm -hmm. Well, that's an interesting summary. I think it was one that everyone would have to uh, agree with. Uh, <laughs> who at least knows the details. <laughs> that's great. So. Well, thank you, Bridget, for uh, participating today in our history in this conversation. Uh, what you said is going to be a fascinating and interesting addition to the repertoire of stories that, that already exist and that we'll be adding over the next period of time, whatever that happens to be. In thanking you, I'm not just thanking you for myself. I've had the pleasure of coming here and um, participating uh, from the other side of the camera. But I'm also thanking you on behalf of Michelle Wu, uh, Frank Hodeck, and Dick Spinelli, our colleagues uh, with whom I am able to work to uh, put together this oral history of law librarianship for Hein Online. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure.